Hi, welcome back to another episode of PT Meal Physical Therapy Podcast, a buffet of play, therapies, movement, exercises, activities, and leisure, all topped with a hearty conversation of physical therapy profession and practice. All right, for today's episode, we have Kenneth Adivino, a physical therapist from West Virginia. He is uh, currently practicing in both acute care and outpatient setting. So, uh, welcome, Kenneth. Thank you, Owen, for having me here in your show. I'm so glad to be here on your show. And congratulations to your new podcast. Wow, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, so we are here to uh, talk about practicing in different settings. And you're, you're currently uh, working in both acute care and outpatient setting. Is that since, uh, since you moved here in the U.S.? Yeah, that's, that's right. I've been uh, working here in the United States for like four years. And um, I've been doing acute care and outpatient for the past four years. And so far, I've been liking it. All right. So before we move further with our conversation, um, could you describe um, briefly how you got into physical therapy? Oh, I got into physical therapy because back in high school, I've been wanting to become a doctor. And so back in the Philippines, I thought as physical therapy as one of my pre-med course. And then um, when I finally got into physical therapy school, that's when I started to like, especially during my internship year, when I started to see the improvements that I, uh, <clears throat> that my patients have. So um, that sense of fulfillment that I got from there, um, that made me decide just to continue practicing the profession. Mm -hmm. So I think um, you're the third, third uh, guest that I had that thought of that way, like having a physical, ther physical therapy uh, course as their pre-med, then, um, then liking the course and not pursuing medicine. Um, yep. So mm -hmm. when, you, you, when you moved here in the U.S., um, did you, were you aware uh, that you will be practicing in both acute care and outpatient physical therapy? Uh, at first, I've always thought I'm going to do acute care because the name of my uh, employer is a hospital. I have never knew that they had an outpatient clinic. So I was really surprised that I will do both outpatient and acute care. But it's not really a big deal with me because the outpatient clinic is just right beside the hospital. It's just like a couple of feet away. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> unlike with some of my friends who are also doing both acute care and outpatient that they have to drive to the hospital just to get into their work. But in my case, I just have to walk so, to do my stuff. So, yeah. it's, a really so it's not really a big, yeah, it's not really a big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, could you describe to to us because I'm not really familiar how the acute care uh, practice here in the U.S. is. So, could you describe to us um, what acute care physical therapy is here in, in the U.S. as compared to how it it is in the in the Philippines when you practice there? Okay, um, <clears throat> acute care in the Philippines, uh, in the United States, I mean, to my definition is a stage in the rehabilitation process wherein the patient just had their injury or we could consider them as um, really having that illness or they're really weak or they're just being inflicted by that injury or that disease or by that surgery. So um, it's not much of a big difference with what we have in the Philippines. Maybe because back in the Philippines, especially with the bigger hospitals in the Philippines, um, you have the bedside physical therapy, you have the bring to center physical therapy, and then you have the outpatient physical therapy. I think the bedside physical therapy is synonymous to the acute care setting here in physical therapy where you see your patients like literally in their bed, you go to their room, do your evaluation, see them there, do, your, do the exercises in the room or do some hallway ambulation. I think that's what acute care uh, physical therapy is. You know, you see them <clears throat> doing their exercises with their IV line on, or you make them walk in the hallway with their IV line and with an assistive device, something like that. You can consider acute care physical therapy in the United, United States as similar to what the bedside physical therapists are doing in the hospitals in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, 
correct me if I'm wrong, um, here in the, the U.S., as much, as much as possible, they would like the patient to be discharged um, as quick as you can, like uh, three days, five days, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, because of the different settings in the United States, like you have acute care, you have inpatient rehabilitation hospitals, you have uh, skilled nursing facilities, you have outpatient clinics, mm -hmm. you have assisted living facilities, you have long-term care, and then you have home health. So mm -hmm. acute care is the first stage in the rehabilitation process. Now in the Philippines, we do bedside physical therapy. And while they're inside the hospital, you bring them to the facility to do their, what we call bring to center rehabilitation. Here in the United States, we do not do that. We do not have like a bring to center kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, usually the patient just stays in the hospital for like three to four days or even and the most that I had was actually um, nine to ten months, but that patient is in the psychiatric ward, mm -hmm. so it's really um, hard for them to discharge that patient. But most of the time, the patient just stays in the hospital within uh, four to five days, and then as an acute care therapist, one of your role here is to be part of the discharge planning team. So once we discharge this patient, where should we continue the care? Should we continue it to the uh, inpatient rehabilitation? Should we continue the health care in the uh, skilled nursing or home health and the assisted living? Mm -hmm. As a physical therapist, you use your judgment to uh, your best clinical judgment to where the patient should go to continue um, his uh, recovery. Mm -hmm. Right. So hospital is the acute care setting. And mm -hmm. once the, the patient is discharged based on your assessment and the other rehab professionals assessment, then you discharge them to any of the subacute care setting, which is the, the yep. skilled nursing facilities, inpatient, in inpatient rehab <clears throat> or home health. Uh, I've worked in, in home health and um, uh, skilled right now, skilled nursing facilities. So uh, we receive patients coming from hospitals, being discharged from hospitals. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, how is it different from um, working in the outpatient setting now in, in where you're working at and the outpatient setting practice in the Philippines? All right. So <clears throat> to be honest, um, the skills that the physical therapists are doing in the Philippines are not really much different from what mm -hmm. the physical therapists are doing here. What I mean to say by that is that you know, physical therapists here, they, they still do modalities, some of them. Mm -hmm. um, they still do manual therapy. They use their goniometer to examine a patient, you know, but they still document the things that, you know, they did for the patient. But the way the treatment and the evaluation stuff is organized is, effect, is affected by several factors. The referral, mm -hmm. um, the insurance of the patient, or if you're in a direct access clinic, there's no referral at all. So it's just a walk-in facility. The patient can be seen by, <clears throat> by the physical therapist without actually a referral from a physician or a primary care provider. Right. So because um, back in the Philippines, our, our setting goes something like the patient is seen by a rehabilitation medicine doctor or a physician or whatever physician that is. Mm -hmm. And then the doctor writes an order for physical therapy. And what I've noticed is that if it's a physiatrist or a doctor specializing in rehabilitation medicine, they actually really sp specify the uh -huh. treatment that you will do for the patient. Uh -huh. Here in my practice in the acute care setting, uh, in the outpatient setting, um, you, you informed our audience a while ago that I practice here in West Virginia. Uh -huh. um, according to the law, West Virginia uh, has 100%, uh, the patients have 100% direct access to physical therapy, to a physical mm -hmm. therapist. So mm -hmm. that means they can come to a physical therapist without being referred by a, by a primary care provider or a uh -huh. doctor or a nurse practitioner. Uh -huh. But unfortunately the, uh, unfortunately, the insurance will not pay for the service if there's no referral from those kinds of practitioner. I see. So actually, uh, from in just my point of view, I it's just kind of like conflicting a little bit unless mm -hmm. you have your own private practice. Mm -hmm. So according to the law, there's a direct access to physical therapy. So 
uh, with my patients in the outpatient setting, they have to be referred by a physician mm -hmm. or a nurse practitioner so that uh, their services can be billed. Because mm -hmm. if not, I won't be, I can still see them, but my services will not be billed or I will not be reimbursed. So I still need to get a prescription mm -hmm. for that one. Uh, okay, so so basically what you're saying is uh, the practice is basically the same as the Philippines. Yep, it's what basically we're doing, the same. But uh -huh. the, the main difference is how we are uh, billing the patients because in the Philippines, we usually see patients uh, privately, meaning they're, they're paying out of their pockets. Yep. I don't see much um, insurance paying them, but there are some insurance that pays for physical therapy in the Philippines as well. So, but That's here right. it's a big t big thing um, for like reimbursements and, and billing. To, to exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and in the Philippines, if you uh, the patients that you see in the Philippines in the outpatient setting, since they've been seen by a doctor, and you know as what you know, I've been a patient in the Philippines too. So. They, you get referred from one doctor to another. You mm -hmm. undergo multiple tests. You undergo multiple ancillary procedures. So, um, uh, so when the patient comes to a physical therapist, there is an exact diagnosis or an exact mm -hmm. pathological finding mm -hmm. for that patient. So mm -hmm. let's say a patient with a knee pain with a history of, like, say, a trauma is mm -hmm. undergone like an MRI. So the patient mm -hmm. is diagnosed with an ACL tear. Mm -hmm. um, so when the patient comes to the physical therapist in the Philippines, you already know that it's already an ACL tear. Mm -hmm. right. But here in the United States, um, what's happening is that um, because of the exact definition, or not exact definition, but I mean like there is a dis distinct um, definition of the roles here of each medical professional. Mm -hmm. Sometimes and due to some insurance issues, sometimes the patient has no exact diagnosis yet, mm -hmm. even though that patient is already referred to for therapy. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes the patient would just say to their physician, I think I'll benefit from physical therapy. So the mm -hmm. patient will, uh, the doctor will just write a prescription for therapy without an exact diagnosis, diagnosis. without a clear pathological finding. Mm -hmm. So say for instance, I receive a lot of diagnosis with just diagnosis of knee pain, just diagnosis of low back pain. You don't know where that back pain is coming from. You don't know where that knee pain is coming from. Right. Um, and then most of the time, it's also because of some insurance limitations. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a lot of patients referred to me for physical therapy saying that when I ask them for their goals for physical therapy, they don't actually know what their goals is because um, what's happening is that... Uh, the insurance will not pay for their MRI mm -hmm. if they did not undergo physical therapy first. I see. So let's say your patient, let's say you have a basketball player mm -hmm. and then he uh, injured his ankle in a game mm -hmm. and he heard a popping sound. So you thought it could be an ACL tear or something like that. Mm -hmm. So he goes to his doctor. The doctor thinks, yeah, it could be an ACL tear or some kind of a meniscal or ligamental tear. Mm -hmm. The doctor would want to do an MRI, but unfortunately, even the physician cannot do an MRI because his insurance will not pay for it unless he goes to a physical therapist first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when the patient comes to you, the diagnosis is just a knee pain. Mm -hmm. It's not an ACL tear. Mm -hmm. So I think the diagnosis code for M, uh, knee pain is M25.5615562, something like that. Uh -huh. So that's the diagnosis that you're going to get. And mm -hmm. as a physical therapist, you have to... Uh, help them recover even without that exact pathological finding from the mm -hmm. diagnosis. So, so something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's say, for example, continuing from that um, type of patient, you get that type of patient, knee pain, and insurance would like for him to do physical therapy first before doing other ancillary procedures. How many visits are, are, are you allowed to see them before um, – uh, before, before going uh, can... eligible for an MRI. Yes. Okay. Some, it depends on their insurance. Actually. Oh, um, okay. It's not a. Uh, it's not a. State yeah. It's law not. Or it's, it's not a state law. It really depends on the uh, policyholder. 
Okay. So uh, it depends on what their policy states. Some some mm-hmm. insurances would be like, okay, after 12 visits, once you're done with 12 visits of physical therapy, whether you recovered or not, you are now eligible for an MRI. Mm-hmm. Or okay. with some insurances, after a month, two times a week for four oh. weeks. So that means eight visits. So it varies. It's not really like, you know, very uh, distinct uh-huh. per patient. But uh, the way I see it, it's it's good for the uh, the physical therapy practice that way because yeah. it somehow validates the importance of physical therapy, the role of the physical therapist in uh, um, diagnosing uh, mm-hmm. pathology. So yep. we are because we are trained in school to to be able to rule out or confirm certain diagnosis. Mm-hmm through our tests, well, assessment, evaluation, special tests. So I, I guess that's a good thing for us that they are able to, they, that the insurers, uh, the insurance companies would like the, the, the patient to undergo physical therapy first rather than go through pro- possibly unnecessary ancillary procedures exactly. when physical therapists can already address that, that symptom. Okay. So... Here's the thing, uh, based on studies, because before I know physical therapists are not uh, doctorate degree holders, so they're mm-hmm. they're just bachelor's or master's degree holders. Yeah, from, back in the day. Back in those days. So mm-hmm. when, and I know it's only the military physical therapists who are doctorate degree holders. So mm-hmm. when back... Um, Back in those days, when the only doctorate, uh, when the only uh, physical therapists who are doctorate degrees are in the military, they've seen that when a phys- when a patient sees a physical therapist who has a doctorate degree, who has that ability to screen, who has that ability to do differential diagnosis, mm-hmm. and design interventions based on the impairments and functional limitations of the patients, um, they've seen. A significant reduction in the cost of healthcare. Right, right. Because uh, it, just like what you've said, um, you know, these physical therapists are able to screen, to diagnose, uh, being able to identify um, the impairments and functional limitations without really having to undergo those kinds of procedures. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So it highlights the role of physical therapy in improving the lives of these people. And I think that's why, you know, having a doctorate degree is, um, it's like necessary for this uh, profession. But I have to uh, say that here's the thing: um, in the outpatient in the outpatient clinic or in the physical therapy realm, we do not really diagnose patients. Right. So right. we don't when when a patient's when a patient come into you with a knee pain. And you did your Lachman test. You did your uh, what? Your anterior uh, anterior shift test, something mm-hmm. like that. Anterior instability test. You do not really tell the patient, "Hey, you have an ACL tear." Right. But at, never... at the back of our mind, we <laughs> have an idea. Yes. What the pathology um, is. Yeah. Yes, that's what it is. So, but the thing is, as physical therapists you are actually the uh, preferred provider for movement and exercise. Mm -hmm. So if there are things that you think that are beyond the scope of your practice, that's when you refer the patient back to his or her physician. Mm -hmm. And as your role as a physical therapist, that's where screening and differential diagnosis would come into play. But most of the time, we usually do, because those two things, those things are different. Differential diagnosis is really exactly different from screening. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the time, what we do really actually is screening mm-hmm. because it's not really our role to diagnose a patient based on his pathology. Right. We can do that. We can just do differential diagnosis, but mm-hmm. we do not screen the patient. So uh, we, we do screen the patients. We do not really diagnose them. Sorry for right, that right. one. So, so, so we screen them, but we, we can't we screen, really diagnose them. Yes, we can't really die. We screen them, but we cannot diagnose them based on their pathology. Right. But, but we can diagnose them with their impairments and functional limitations. Right. Like difficulty in walking, difficulty, difficulty in walking, day. jumping, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So here's right. the thing. Uh, 
for billing purposes again, mm -hmm. when a, let's say for instance, this one is a knee replacement, mm -hmm. okay? So the medical diagnosis is knee replacement. Right. When you, when you document, you don't just write their knee replacement mm -hmm. or the ICD-10 code for the, knee re, for the knee replacement. You have to put there a rehab diagnosis uh -huh. because R you are not, yeah, R62 or M25.561, something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, uh, for those who are not aware of the ICD-10 codes, the ICD-10 codes are a big list of all the diagnoses, of all mm -hmm. the illnesses, of mm -hmm. all the issues that medical, even psychiatric or even psychological issues that the patient has. You will even mm -hmm. have a diagnosis for a uh, peck by a chicken, hit by uh, a lightning, right, right. Uh, trouble with the in-law, something like that. So Also with a specific... Um, laterality with laterality so mm. that's what the icd-10 code is all about so if for i think for knee replacement i think it begins with a z96 something like yeah, that yeah so if it's a knee replacement so if you just write in write in your note total knee replacement z96 blah 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 whatsoever the insurance will not pay you for that because you are mm. not really addressing the knee replacement itself mm. you are addressing yeah. the functional limitation or the impairment that comes from the knee replacement. So you have to put in there to a rehab diagnosis. So mm -hmm. and what are the usual rehab diagnosis for someone who has knee replacement? The R26.2, the difficulty mm -hmm. with walking. Um, Gate and mobility. M yeah, and mobility, M25.561, knee pain, left. Mm -hmm. I don't know, is that the left or the right? I forgot, mm -hmm. but something like that. So, so as physical therapist, you will, uh, you will not get a specific diagnosis in right. the outpatient most of the time. Mm -hmm. Although you can still get a specific diagnosis, especially if the patient has undergone several tests. If you're going to mm -hmm. ask me, why are some patients have undergone, have undergone several tests, the others have not? It depends on their insurance. It depends on their insurance. It depends also on the clinical reasoning of their physician. Mm -hmm. So it comes from a lot of factors. Some physician mm -hmm. would really want the patient to... Uh, have that ancillary procedure, that MRI, but unfortunately, they're also limited by the insurance. So, you know, so as a physical therapist, if a patient comes, comes into you with knee pain, you have to not just examine them for their knee pain. You also have to examine them or to screen them, actually, for mm -hmm. other pathologies that could come with the knee pain. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, say, for instance, a patient would... Uh, uh, say that yeah I have a knee pain but it feels like my calf is also hurting mm -hmm. and so from there you have to screen the patient for DVT is there like a blood clot is it a mm -hmm. torn Achilles tendon as well something mm -hmm. like that so you have to screen them for that too and if you see something that could be beyond the scope of physical therapy or you are kind of doubtful with the diagnosis mm -hmm. that you have in your own that's when you refer the patient back to the doctor so so easier said than done so do I, if the patient complains of something else other than knee pain do i just refer them back to the doctor no mm -hmm. you really have to exercise your clinical reasoning skills because again if you send them back to the doctor that's another insurance stuff correct that's another reimbursement issue so mm -hmm. you really have to exercise uh, exercise your clinical reasoning skills whether do I need to refer this patient like ASAP, like right now, stop the mm -hmm. treatment, stop the evaluation, refer the patient right now to the doctor or refer the patient back to the doctor, but I can still see the patient for an examination, but postpone mm -hmm. the treatment mm -hmm. or refer the patient back to the doctor, but I can still continue with the evaluation and treatment. Right. So it's not right. an urgent kind of referral. Mm -hmm. So you have to exercise your best clinical reasoning and judgment when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. Meaning yeah. you have to be really quite familiar on uh, red flags to Red flags, yeah. Mm -hmm. Red flags. When, when to refer the patient back to the doctor? Uh -huh. Or is it really the doctor that you need the patient to be referred to? Or you a might specialist. Need to or, or, yeah. Or do you need to refer the patient to an orthotist? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You found out that there's like a leg length discrepancy that cannot mm -hmm. be corrected by manual therapy techniques right right but so, in those cases do you try to address uh what you can first and see what you can do or once you see that there are 
um, things that that's out of your scope, do you refer immediately back to a different specialist or a doctor? Yeah, I, I've had a lot of. Again, again, it varies. So yeah, you will have depends to use on the situation. Best, it depends on the situation. You really have to exercise your best judgment when it comes to that. So say, for instance, I had a patient before with back pain, uh -huh. and he said, when I screened him for other stuff, um, have you been having difficulty in urinating lately? Mm -hmm. And he right. said, yes. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your back pain? Oh, I cannot really pinpoint where the exact pain is. It's all around my back. And then sometimes it shoots shoots all the way down to my testicles. So mm -hmm. from then I said, okay, I think we got to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we got to stop. Because? You, you might need to go to the doctor now because I don't know. Uh, there could be some urinary issues that could be going on. Mm -hmm. So I did not really tell the patient that you have a kidney problem. Uh -huh. You don't do that because that's beyond your scope of practice. Right, right. You just tell them that the back pain could be a result of other factor and may mm. not be coming from the back pain itself. Right. Or, I mean, from the bones back. of the back or the muscles, muscles of the back itself or the ligaments of the back or mm -hmm. the nerves of the back or right, whatsoever. Right. It could be another source of issue that mm. needs immediate concern. Did you follow up with that, that uh, patient? Did, did yep. you find out? So what happened with yep. that patient? Apparent, apparently, the patient really had a kidney stone. Oh, see, okay. That's re that, that really shows how important our screening and our skill our is. Screening, our yep. screen. mm -hmm. I, think, mm -hmm. I think that's why uh, the insurances are... Trusting us. Yeah, trusting us so much because, see, if, you, if they send that patient immediately to like a CT scan, or mm -hmm. I mean like, uh, or let's say for instance, let's say a patient who really had a back, uh, uh, let's say, musculoskeletal origin of back pain. Let's mm -hmm. say just a simple muscle strain. Mm -hmm. You know, that can be addressed by physical therapy even mm -hmm. though you did not do x-rays or MRIs. Right. So that already saved, you know, several the dollars. And the, the patient uh, several, and the insurance company several uh, dollars, you know. Because mm -hmm. you don't know also if the patient will need physical therapy later on for another body region. Correct, correct. So mm -hmm. that saves them a lot of dollars too. So, mm -hmm. so in that sense, you know, uh, the efficiency of the physical therapist in uh, screening patients for other issues is really of an utmost importance here because it would, for economical reasons, it would really save the insurance and the patients several dollars for that mm -hmm. one. Yeah, for their copay. Yeah. So, um, okay. and. Uh, Let's go back to your um, acute care practice. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned a while back when we were like um, conversing before that you also practice in sometimes in the emergency department. So how is oh, that? Because yeah. in the Philippines, we don't uh, have physical therapists practicing in the emergency department. So how, how, how is that in, 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 in that kind of setting? What does physical therapist do in the emergency department? All right, so what the physical therapist, okay, uh, physical therapy in the emergency room department is a trending uh, area mm -hmm, of, practice of practice for the profession. Yeah. Um, there is now a need, that's really the very acute of all the acute care. Right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, because people would go the, into the emergency department for about like, very unstable yeah. medical condition, you know. So, so far in the hospital that I work in, the physical therapists are being called in the emergency room to uh, see their uh, impairments and functional limitations if they are suspected of stroke. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so um, um, I do uh, the usual physical therapy examination in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't just refer the patient. They make sure that the patient is at least within their vital signs, they're stable. Mm -hmm. So, because with that one, because, you know, stroke can be evolving. Right, right. Can be know. transient at, at first, then evolves. Yeah, transient the first, and then stroke. evolves, and then before it stabilizes. Uh -huh. So, sometimes you teach the caregivers, if there are any caregivers, mm -hmm. you teach them on... Um, what could be if let's say the patient 
progressively weakens later mm-hmm. on uh-huh. like how to teach them like to transfer from this to a chair and then mm-hmm. you know then send them to the hospital afterwards you know something like that you check mm-hmm. for their strength you check for their balance you check for their coordination mm-hmm. you check for the way they walk you check for their bed mobility skills um you uh you try to check them for that and then you try to do the necessary um adjustments you teach them um how to use a walker mm-hmm. how to use a cane make mm-hmm. sure that they're not false actually it's like most of the time it's making sure that they're not false risk that they're not okay. going to fall at home mm-hmm. that they're not going to fall at home so something like that mm-hmm. that's what we do now if it's an orthopedic case if it's an orthopedic case usually it's a very simple orthopedic case that just requires outpatient surgery or probably um just like uh internal fixation mm-hmm. um no sorry not internal fixation i mean uh close reduction i mean okay. it's a fracture they're just a close reduction uh-huh. and then they are placed into a boot for instance mm-hmm. and then you have to teach them how to use the crutch mm-hmm. before they, they before they you know they're sent home so something like that that's what we that's what we do in the emergency room so technically if you're going to ask me what we do there we examine them the usual mm-hmm. check for their bed mobility their transfers balance assessment ambulation check their sensation um and then you screen them also for other issues. Like uh, if you see that their speech is starting to get slurred, you might, and then there's, they have some swallowing difficulties. That's when I tell the doctor, uh, you might want to do a speech therapy consult for this patient. Mm-hmm. Or if you see that there's like an ADL issue, like feeding issue, patient cannot use um, some uh, dining utensils. That's when I tell the doctor, the patient might benefit from an occupational therapy consult. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, something like that. But so for, again, for orth- mm-hmm. but it's, it's it's usually yeah, um, it's usually on fall risk assessment and yeah, making sure that they're they're not false risk, making uh-huh. sure that they don't have they don't have other issues, they don't have other mobility issues. Mm-hmm. And patient education, caregiver education, mm-hmm. and related to physical uh, related to rehabilitation, not physical care, right. but rehabilitation, rehabilitation in general yeah, itself. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So that includes speech swallowing. Mm-hmm uh adls and stuff mm-hmm. and yeah. also in um assistive device training yes assistive mm-hmm. device training that includes that one determining what's the best assistive device for them because mm-hmm. i've had patients before yeah they were they had a fracture and then the patient undergone close reduction mm-hmm. they put a boot on the uh, ankle and leg mm-hmm. and then they're not pretty sure whether to use a crutch or to use a walker for this patient Right. So that's when the physical therapist would come in. They want to send this patient home. The patient mm-hmm. doesn't really need to be admitted to the hospital. Mm-hmm. So the doctor is not really sure whether to give a crutch or a cane. Mm-hmm. I mean, crutch or a walker, I mean. Mm-hmm. So that's when physical therapy comes, physical in. comes in, comes in uh-huh. to do some crutch walking instruction or assistive device assessment, mm-hmm. you know, something like that. Or the patient might need a wheelchair. <laughs> right, right, right. So how did you feel yeah. when you found out that you will be practicing in an emergency department? Oh, actually, um, it was kind of exciting and terrifying at the same time because, you know, uh-huh. it's the emergency room. Right. You know how unstable the patients are in the mm-hmm. emergency room, you know, mm-hmm. and how hectic the emergency room is. Um, at first, I was kind of like panicking. Will I be called like at 12 midnight just to see a patient in the emergency room? <laughs> right, but right, right. Fortunately, I haven't been called yet. Knock on wood, no. I haven't been called yet to do some physical <laughs> therapy. Because, you know, a stroke can happen at any time. There's right. Somebody could have a stroke at 12 midnight. So, will I be able to do that? I, uh, uh-huh. I, am I going to do that? So far, I haven't done that one. <laughs> and also, I the patient the will be like... Um, yeah, I think I, I'm having a stroke. Noticed, why would I have physical therapy? <laughs> yeah, uh, from what I've noticed, they really make sure that the vitals are stable at least uh-huh. in the emergency room. Uh-huh. Um, they're not. Uh, most of the patients that I've seen in the emergency room are actually they're already good to go. When okay. you see them, they're not like in distress, like they're uh-huh. not like having like a, or like a slurred speech or something like that. Yeah. No, most of the stroke patients that I've seen in the emergency room or are being suspected of having a stroke, they're actually 90% fine. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Seldom that I've seen uh, 
obvious uh, no, deficits. Or, uh, no, obvious deficits. Mm, in the yeah. acute care, yes, they are yeah. they they are really having some mobility issues in that. Uh -huh. So, but in the emergency departments, uh, most of the time they're fine when you go there for. Assessment. Yeah, most of the time they're fine. That's the funny part. Most of the time they're they're fine. They're just the doctor is just wanting to make sure that this patient is not really a false risk when they send this patient home. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how how um. In in assessment in evaluating a, a, a patient in the emergency department, does it have to be fast as well, or you can do like you can take your time in, in evaluating the whole uh, the the whole system of the the patient? You can take your time. You got oh, okay. you just have to do what you have to do. Uh -huh. You got to do what you want to do for the patient. Hmm. Um, make like sure you said, screen everything. Mm -hmm. Make like what I've said. If you've seen this patient having like a speech issue. Mm -hmm. Some memory or cognitive issues are ready. Mm -hmm. That's when you know you really have to because again, as a physical therapist, you're not just limited to those aspects of mobility, aspects right. of impairments like strength balance, uh, what muscle strength balance, bed mobility transfers, ambulation, sens sensation. No, mm -hmm. you're not only limited to that one. Mm -hmm. You can yeah. also screen for cognition for speech right. and language uh -huh. for adl when i say screen you do not really have to do objective findings on that one mm -hmm. when i say screen you can just ask the caregiver that's already screening yep let's, yeah. let's say the patient is in comatose uh-huh you know, if you ask the caregiver um how this how is this patient you know um before the event or if the patient cannot speak for yeah or if the patient cannot speak for himself Mm -hmm. You can already ask the caregiver. That's already part of the screening, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. if you ask the patient, and then, or if you talk to the patient, and you're already seeing some difficulty in communicating with you, some delayed in thought processes, right. you might want to. Uh, you might want to put there in your note that the patient might benefit for further evaluation by a speech therapist, something like yeah. that. And also, you get to prepare the the caregiver, the family member, on what to mm -hmm. expect. Um, after um, being discharged in, in the emergency department, so that they know yeah. how to handle it, right? Yep, that's right. So in practicing right. in both settings, in in both acute care and outpatient setting, what are the what do you think are the lessons that you've learned in in, in practicing in both settings? Uh, the lessons that I've learned in practicing in both settings is that. Um, I think I, we are just a very valuable member of the healthcare team. Mm -hmm. um, your role as a physical therapist, actually here in the United States, I really felt our value as a physical therapist. You are really the movement expert here. Mm -hmm. um, you are the mobility expert. So our job is very you know, very much appreciated. Right. And I've learned to become more critical in my clinical thinking skills, in my clinical mm -hmm. decision-making skills, because mm -hmm. uh, technically you are a doctor actually. So you mm -hmm. are on your own. Mm -hmm. You have, you have your own, you have your own set of practice. Right. You have your own boundaries within your practice. You no one will tell you, Mm -hmm. You have your own scope. No one will tell you do only passive range. No mm -hmm. one will tell you that. Although they can tell you at times, but most of the time, no one. Mm -hmm. So you will have to do your best clinical judgment in here. In the outpatient, for instance, um, let's say I have a vestibular case. Mm -hmm. Is it really a BPPV? Mm -hmm. Or is it really like a central lesion central. or something mm -hmm. like that? Or mm -hmm. like... A vestibular issue as a result of autotoxicity, something like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. or you're having vestibular issues because you've just had a recent infection, mm -hmm. something like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, you got to figure out where the issue is really coming from. Mm -hmm. You know, something like so. It's I I really like the less the main lesson that I've re really learned here is that you really have to be very diligent. Mm -hmm. in your clinical decision making skills mm -hmm. because you're really very you're an independent uh 
independent member of the healthcare team, independent and codependent at the same time because right. you it's again it's the rehabilitation team. So you have to uh, there will come a time that you have to talk to the other members of the healthcare team, mm-hmm. even outside the hospital setting or outside the clinic. Mm-hmm. Such that I have to contact the uh, orthotist. Sometimes I even have to call uh, to talk to the case manager. Right. Say, right. For, instance, for instance, in the acute care. So in the acute care, your role there as a physical therapist is to really see where this patient will go after being discharged from the hospital. Mm-hmm. So will the patient benefit from an inpatient rehab? Will the patient benefit from a skilled nursing? Mm-hmm. Other than preventing the impairments of long, uh, long-term hospitalization, you know, long-term, long-term effects of immobility, mm-hmm. your uh, role in the discharge planning is very significant. You are not the one who will tell the patient when to be discharged from the hospital because right. that's the doctor's job or the physician's job. Right. But to where, where to send the patient after being discharged is one of your roles there. You have to tell the case manager. Just like what I had a while ago, um, the patient had a hip replacement. Um, you know, the patient stays with a caregiver, mm-hmm. but the patient is really weak. The mm-hmm. patient cannot even get up from the bed. Uh-huh. Um, so you give them their the, your strong yeah, recommendation. The yeah, the caregiver wants to send the patient back home. Mm-hmm. He wants to take care of the patient, but apparently he's not also able because the caregiver has also other medical issues. Right. We so, have a lot of cases like that too, right? Yeah. So we have to really convince the uh, caregiver that it's not safe for this patient to be sent home. Mm-hmm. It's not safe for the patient it's, and it's not safe for you as the caregiver because you might injure yourself in taking care of this patient. Right. So right. you have to tell them that this patient might benefit in a skilled nursing first. Mm-hmm. Just build some uh, some strength in their muscles mm-hmm. before you know they can be sent home at least right. get a home health therapist something like that so right right and then you have to tell the case manager about it you know mm-hmm. and then you have to sometimes uh even uh write an appeal to the insurances mm-hmm. oh, sometimes they will not one. cover for, mm-hmm, sometimes they will not cover the inpatient rehab for instance right right Mm-hmm. Let's say I have a I had a patient uh, yesterday. I had a patient in the hospital that had a spinal cord stimulator mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, to uh, mobilize the legs right. to improve the strength of the legs. And this patient has been in a skilled uh, or, or came from a skilled nursing. Mm-hmm. So I told the case manager, this patient we need to maximize that spinal cord stimulator, mm-hmm. and the patient will benefit from an inpatient rehab. Right, where mm-hmm. he will get an hour of physical therapy, intensive physical therapy. Mm-hmm. So, but apparently, this patient has an insurance that will not cover for an inpatient rehab. Mm-hmm. But at least <laughs> you were saying, able to uh, give your strong, my concern. Mm-hmm. yeah, your strong recommendation just in case um, things would happen. Okay. At least you were able to um, yep. let them know that this is what the patient really needs. It's up to you if you're gonna um, follow it or From, not. But but From what rehab. I have heard a while ago, this pa- uh, they were uh, they were kind of successful. Mm-hmm. I think this patient now will be sent to an inpatient rehab. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, um, what are the uh, challenges that you you encountered when you first um, moved here in the U.S. and went into like acute care, emergency department, and outpatient setting? The, can you think of uh, um? challenge that you faced when you started and, and how you handled those? Okay, the challenges that I face is first, so let me start first with the outpatient. Um, in the outpatient, the challenges that I've faced is that you being <laughs> an independent clinician, right. getting a vague diagnosis, like what I've said, knee pain, like what am I going to treat with knee pain? Right, Where right. is this knee pain coming from? Mm-hmm. Um, those kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did I deal with that? I that's why I took my DPT. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what I took my DPT because in the DPT school, um, actually in the DPT school, from the school that I've been, they did not really focus much on the differentials. That, uh, differentials. Uh-huh. But? But they focus more on when to refer a patient back to the doctor. Mm-hmm. Is it an urgent referral or a, a current, you know, or... A referral, but you need a, the patient needs a referral, but not urgent, or the patient doesn't need 
referral or atom. Mm-hmm. Um, those kinds of stuff. Uh-huh. Um, How about in the next, emergency department? In the emergency department, it actually I'm I'm, I'm gonna combine the emergency and, and the acute care. Acute care. Uh-huh. Um, challenges that I've dealt with is with the case managers at times. Mm-hmm. Um, like you know, sometimes the patient cannot really move, mm-hmm. for instance, but they want me to make the patient walk because apparently they already found a placement. Uh, uh, because his insurance will not pay for this, will not pay for for for, right. for a home health. So I have yeah. to make this patient walk. Uh-huh. Or else this patient this patient will stay longer in the hospital. Right, like, right. Like that kind of stuff. You yeah. know. But as much as we want to, we're not miracle workers, right? Yeah, we're not we're yeah. miracle workers. Um But we try our best. In those cases, well in those in those cases I just you just really have to have a good documentation skills. Right. Hmm. And, even, and even and uh, even to protect yourself. And sometimes even it's not just you that will attest to that. Even the nurses will attest to that one too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, right. so you know those kinds of stuff. Um, uh, I think I forgot to mention that I'm also doing physical therapy in the psychiatric ward. Oh wow, interesting. Of the hospital because our mm-hmm. hospital also has a psychiatric ward. Mm-hmm. It has three units: the uh, geriatric, the adults, and the. Uh, Adolescents. Mm-hmm. So the adolescents, those are like the uh, delinquent teenagers, you know. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then the adults, you know, the adults, then the geriatric population, usually with right. those with dementia, dementia and Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. Dementia and Alzheimer's. And so, uh-huh. you know, that, that, that's, that's really challenging because we, um, in, in the SNF, we have, we get a lot of psychiatric patients and it's really difficult for them. I imagine it's more difficult if it's uh, in the hospital. In the acute care. Yeah, in uh-huh. the acute, acute care. care. Uh-huh. In the acute care, because um, you know, again, it's the acute care, so they're uh-huh. really more emotionally <laughs> right. stable. They're more uh-huh. emotionally unstable, and, and you gotta make them walk. Oh, correct. And, and they're and, probably and, and, their medications are not yet not, synced mm-hmm. or balanced to their needs. And for our and for our audience, if people, if if they're wondering what's the role of the physical therapy in the psychiatric ward setting, right? Uh-huh. I just want to let you know some some of the psychiatric illnesses are. I just realized this actually when I started to work in the psychiatric setting. Some of the psychiatric illnesses are really can really impair one's mobility and function. Mm-hmm. Same for instance, if uh, the severity of schizophrenia is really bad. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they don't even realize that they've been in bed for like seven days. Really? Oh. They've been in bed for seven days. Mm-hmm. So, because they don't know what's going on. <laughs> they, uh-huh. You know, their mind is not there. Right. And, and they're, they're taking a lot of um, uh, medications. medications too. Mm-hmm. They're taking out medication. So, you as a physical therapist, you've got to get them going. Mm-hmm. You've you got to get them up from that bed. Mm-hmm. Or... They're, they're locking themselves. We're well, not really locking, but they're just in the room. They don't want mm-hmm. to go out. Right. You know, and you know that exercise improves mental well-being as well. Correct. Uh, so you, as a physical therapist, is a uh, purveyor of exercise in that facility. So I mean, in that setting, to mm-hmm. improve because you know studies have shown that exercise promotes mental uh, mental health. And again, Correct. like what I've said, a lot of psychiatric diseases or illnesses can really be you know debilitating uh-huh. when it comes to uh, mobility and function right, like right. some of them some of them actually they are walking uh-huh. i mean their balance are not that bad but because uh-huh. of their mental illness they're just sitting in the chair for for the whole day right right and, and we know that inactivity would produce uh muscle atrophy yeah that's mm-hmm. right right and uh what um, could you think of uh, traits that you had um, in in your training in the Philippines that you brought or you you felt was essential for you when you um, went here in the U.S. in your practice, and also what are the traits that you learned from your practice here that you probably wasn't that much of a big deal in the Philippines but was really uh, something that is really 
useful here that you learned? Okay. Uh, I think one of the traits from the Philippines that I'm really proud that I brought here mm -hmm. is, um, I would say, our work ethics. Mm -hmm. So when I say work ethics, we are really dedicated to our job. Mm -hmm. We are, and the job for us is not just a job. It's really a passion. Right. So I would say right. <clears throat> it's not just a way to get dollars. It's not just mm -hmm. a way to get money it's mm. a way to express what you want in life and mm. that's that is to help others i think mm. filipinos by nature we are you know a very helpful and passionate individuals mm. we really like to take care of people mm -hmm. so i think that's one of the traits that i brought here in the united states is that you know sometimes you go beyond your job as a physical therapist for your patients in the um Let's say, for instance, in the uh, in the uh, in the acute care, sometimes you know, if the personal care assistant or the CNA is not available, sometimes you uh, you also like um, bring them coffee in their That's room. That's true. That's true. Something like that, uh -huh. you know. So we um, go we, above and beyond. We go we go above and beyond um, the job description. <laughs> That's true. Sometimes you can also be the maintenance <laughs> department. <laughs> That's now, true. especially here with the current coronavirus thing, so mm. I do not just depend on the maintenance people to clean and disinfect the uh, treatment areas in the outpatient. So I, I, as much as possible, I well, not as much as possible. I really have to disinfect all the equipment right. that I've used with the patient. So yeah, that's everyone's you know, role now. That's everyone's role now. It's not just a housekeeper's role now or the maintenance right. department's role. It's, it's your role now because you were the ones who saw this patient. You know, the medical condition of this patient. So you might be as well be doing that right and then and then for instance in my case in the outpatient i'm not just a clinician <laughs> i i also deal with the insurances mm -hmm. so i talk to the insurance people i have to familiarize myself with the icd 10 codes i have to familiarize myself with the billing i have to familiarize myself with the phone numbers mm -hmm who to talk to, what does a copay mean, what does, what right. does a deductible mean, right. um, you know, those yeah. kinds of terms with the insurance. You know, in the Philippines, I do not have to deal with those no, no. because the patients pay from out of their pocket. Correct. Here, I have to understand what a copay means, what a deductible mm. means, mm -hmm. what a premium means, right. you know, something like that. Um, yeah. With, you know, those kinds <laughs> of stuff. So I have, I, Filipinos go beyond that one mm -hmm. and we are very much willing to help right now with the traits that I've, I've learned here in the united states i think um i don't know because the practice in the philippines is kind of different the healthcare mm -hmm. system is kind of different when a patient comes to the doctor the doctor sends the patient to a different medical practitioners before that patient gets sent to a physical therapist. Here, it's mm -hmm. the opposite. Because mm -hmm. again, physical therapy here, it's kind of like direct access. Correct. A patient comes to a doctor and then the patient, uh, the doctor sends the patients to you. So, sometimes the patient just spent five minutes in the doctor's office. Uh-huh. And you do so, more assessment than them. Yeah, you do more assessment than them. That's why mm -hmm. your ability to screen a patient. Again, not really diagnose because diagnosis is the job of the doctors. Mm -hmm. Not even when, not even when uh, with the diagnostic imaging thing. Mm -hmm. You can you can read you can read the X ray, the CT mm -hmm. scan, the MRI, mm -hmm. but you do not really tell the patient that hey, you got a ruptured disc. Right, right. You, know, you don't you don't mm -hmm. tell them that. Yeah, you just or, explain what like in layman's terms what the interpretation is so that they can understand what it means and then yeah. ask the doctor for further information for further in for further information yeah mm -hmm. that uh, like you know yeah you don't really tell them that hey you got a uh, fracture on your back no you don't mm -hmm. tell them that one because mm -hmm. that's going beyond the scope of your practice mm -hmm. but if you see something weird on the x-ray that's when you talk to the doctor right mm -hmm. you know it, it, um so in short, the thing that I really learned here in my practice here in the U.S. that would be an utmost important in the Philippines is like, I guess, is 
you know the ability to screen the patient mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. patient education mm-hmm. actually it's more of patient education because in the uh. philippines we don't do much we don't do much patient education in the philippines right i, I yeah. think the only thing that we do there is yeah we do home exercise program correct me if i'm wrong yeah, yeah we give them we give them home exercise program mm. but it's not really like you know telling them that let's say this patient is a clerk in the office you don't tell them they adjust your seat right right adjust your seat adjust your the monitor yeah. of yeah. your screen yeah. um uh you know when to do the exercises mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. how will this help you how will you prevent this from coming back in the future right right you know we do a lot of patient education here mm-hmm. we try to empower our patients as much as we can mm-hmm. you know um uh, because you know information now is readily available to this patient and as a physical right. therapist it's it's your job to clarify those information that they get from the internet and, exactly and uh, to clarify stuff with them Right, because again, I, I, an empower an empowered patient is a compliant patient. So right, that's nice. With, with great compliance comes better and significant improvements in functions. Right, right, that's right. Well, so, but I, I think, um, in fairness, with the Philippine practice, we do our um, patient education there. Um, I remember also when I was working in hospitals. I think I think with different settings. Uh, there are different levels of patient education that you can provide, but for for settings in the Philippines that are less patient load, you can provide more patient education mm-hmm. as um, opposed to those who are in settings that you you handle a lot of patients, where yeah. you you sometimes provide this little um, patient education. But I, but I, I believe um, uh, it, it, it's, yeah, it, it's in, it depends on the setting in the Philippines, how yeah. on, on your I time agree. and how much you can provide patient education. Patient. Yeah, right. Patient, edu- yeah. Yeah, patient education, yeah. yeah. And then, like, what we do here also, like, some task modification correct something yeah. like that you mm-hmm. advise them on how can they deal with this thing at work mm-hmm. how can they still be functional even though uh their elbow hurts or their knee right. hurts right you know those kinds of things and then actually the funny thing is that a lot of my patients would come to me and i tell them what's going on with them and then they will um some of them will be like not um only a few of their doctors have told them what's really going on with them. Mm. And, and we explain it better. We ex- yeah, we try to explain it better and how it affects to their function and why right. why is it why is it that they're having difficulty with such aspect of their activities of daily living, for instance. Mm. So we we try to explain to them it's because of this and this mm-hmm. and this, mm-hmm. you know. And with that one, they become really like engaged in their uh treatment right yeah and the more that they they know about their disease process the more that they understand it the more they see the importance of what they're doing Doing therapy therapy. right Mm -hmm. the more that they find meaning to what they do in physical therapy so yeah like what i've said more uh good compliance lead to uh significant achievement in functional outcomes so right right so again uh, so well, that was a, a great conversation with you, uh, uh, Kenneth. So are you ready for your last question? <laughs> so we're now in our last question. All right, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> so <Bring> um, <laughs> <laughs> so in, in your practice or in, in life in general, what would be the three ingredients that you think that are essential in your life right now it can be in your practice it can be in your life in general that you always carry with you three things it can be a person it can be an event it can be a a trait it can be a personality whatever it is that you feel that is important uh, that you always carry with you in each and every day of your practice and in, in your life okay the three things that i carry a lot and that you care, my best friend is the walker. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
my best friend is the walker. Okay. Oh, the be- my best friend is the walker and my aide. Because <laughs> um, in the in the hospital that I work, I get, really get a lot of um, bariatric cases. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they are really very important to me. I cannot live without my gate built and without the walker or even the podium. I cannot live without the mask because I need <laughs> to wear the mask. Uh-huh. Um, in the outpatient, um, in the outpatient, I need that movable desk <laughs> to document <laughs> while yeah. I'm seeing the patient because you don't have much time really actually to document. So while you're seeing the patient, you're already starting to document what you're doing with the patient. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when it comes to the trait in general, both in the acute care and and in the outpatient is your ability to relate well with people. Because mm-hmm. um, our profession, I could say it's a service kind of profession. It's service oriented. Mm-hmm. It's service oriented. You're not the boss there. Mm-hmm. Your patient is your boss. So, so you have to deal with your patient really well. You really have to be an effective listener. Mm-hmm. You really have to be an effective listener. Uh, I would say la- language is still a barrier for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have a lot of slang here that's not mm-hmm. really a common slang. Like I don't know before when I first got in here, I don't know what a buggy is. Mm-hmm. Just to find out that it's a pu- it's a push cart. Oh, <laughs> it's a push cart. Uh-huh. You know? so something like that. So they have their own slang here. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you, you really have to relate well to your patient. Be uh-huh. an effective listener. If you didn't get what they're saying, just just try to repeat the question. I mean, repeat what they're saying, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and see if you understand them, if, it, if your see, understanding is correct. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then try try to put yourself in your patient's shoes. Because mm-hmm. I remember one time I asked my patient who has a back pain. And then, and then I asked, I told him, to, in order for you to avoid or to lessen your back pain, try to lessen the time in which you go or or with or in which you uh, lessen the time in which you walk uphill. Mm-hmm. And then he was like, Well, we are in West Virginia, we are in the mountains. Yeah. Tell me what area here is it. Tell me a fl- where's the a flat area here. Yeah. <laughs> nothing right. like that. So yeah. you have to you have to try to uh, imagine yourself in your patient's uh, situation as well. You have to be you have to empathize with them. Mm-hmm. All right. you, know, you have to be an emphatic uh, therapist. Therapist, not just like giving them instructions and stuff like yeah. that. Mm-hmm. You have to relate to them and 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 try to put yourself in their situation. Yeah, try to put yourself in their situation. Uh, that's why you always ask them with their goals. So you, I always ask my patient, what do you want to get out of physical therapy? Mm-hmm. You know, what do you want to get out of physical therapy? After this, after all of this, what do you want to get from from this service that I'm gonna give you? Right, right. And yeah, try to meet try to meet them in the middle. Right. Because when yeah. the importance there of asking them I also with with what their goals are is to have them engage. If they have that um goal in their mind, then it will the motivation comes from them and you don't need to push them that hard as yeah. opposed to having your own goal for their goal for them which they don't like or they they're, they're not aiming for it, then you will be having a hard time motivating them that's right mm-hmm. that's right that's right and you know you will they, like i said if they understand what's going on with them they will be able to cooperate with you more mm-hmm. they'll be more patient with you they will be mm-hmm. they'll be willing to uh, work through the pain correct and work over yeah. the pain mm-hmm. something like that because a lot of patients you know let's say for instance because a basic philosophy of your patients for instance is that why am i going to move when i'm in pain i'm already mm-hmm. in pain just let me rest right mm-hmm. you know I, it doesn't make sense that i'm going to move mm-hmm. while i'm already in pain so you really have to explain to them what's going to happen if they move and what mm-hmm. kind of movement they're going to do. You have to remove that fear. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to remove that fear, work on their, uh, work on their belief that, mm-hmm. you know, 
pain is gonna I mean exercise is gonna cause further pain mm-hmm. right you know right. something like that yep so you have to be more uh, try to convince them that right. you know exercise is medicine right that's uh, that's what we been taught in the school and, and that's what we're um, living by that yeah. our exercises are therapeutic it's like medicine you take it every day twice a day mm-hmm. do those twice exercises yeah yeah do those exercises because mm-hmm. like what I said the shift now in healthcare is not in you know not with the pills or everything mm-hmm. it's more of like promoting a healthy lifestyle through, mm-hmm. through diet and exercise Mm-hmm. And if you already have the disease or the illness or the pathology, um, not all diseases and pathology can be dealt with those pills or surgeries even. Correct. Yeah. And then with the rising cost of healthcare, especially in the United States, the role of the physical therapist in preventing the patient to undergo surgery is very mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. Or to minimize their stay in the hospital. Right. And that also plays a big role on the importance of the physical therapist in 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 those uh, in, in that goal of promoting yeah. lifestyle activity. All right. Yep. Well, again, thank you, Kenneth, for your time. You're very welcome. And I hope this is not the last uh, time that we talk and and be a guest. In yeah, night. sure. Okay. All right. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. Hey, have a good night.